1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and uh, we have been in this series and of theology matters and uh, things that uh, are a part of theology, or maybe we should say this, uh, what we believe uh, matters and uh, say, well, you know, I'll just leave all that doctrine and that Bible teaching up to pastors and teachers and let them uh, worry about that and I'll just go through life. Can I tell you, uh, God intended for each of us to learn His Word, uh, to understand His Word, and uh, in a way become a personal theologian, uh, to study God and know Him. Uh, and so I hope these have been a help to you. And the next in our installment here tonight from 1 John chapter 1 and I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Once you found it, let's stand together and we're going to read uh, a couple of verses here. 1 John chapter 1 and 2. I'll keep trying. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for Your atonement on the cross. And Lord, I thank You that You shed Your blood for all who are lost, and then You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Lord, you are the Savior of all men, especially them that believe. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand this biblical truth tonight and that we would not be led astray into areas of doctrine and theology that would cause us no longer to have compassion on the lost, no longer to spread the gospel properly, and Lord, I pray that you would keep our hearts aflame for you and fill us, Lord, with your spirit tonight to hear your word and to preach it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Limited atonement. Limited atonement. It almost sounds to me like an oxymoron. How many of you know uh, what an oxymoron? That's not a stupid cow, okay? Uh, that is a set of words that when put together, uh, they seem to be in conflict uh, with each other. Like one of my favorite trucks, the Dodge Ram. You either dodge something or you ram it. I don't know how you can have a Dodge Ram or I've heard people talk about having a sunshade. Uh, well, I'm sorry, those, those two don't just go together. You go down to the restaurant, you know, and uh, you order some jumbo shrimp, okay? I, I don't know how that works, you know, shrimp meaning small, jumbo uh, meaning large. And so uh, often we have these sets of words that when you put them together, you say that's, that's an unusual uh, set of words. And the first time I came across this idea of limited atonement, I thought, what? Why is the word limited with the word atonement? If you know the word of the Bible, atonement, it means a covering for sin. And therefore, Jesus Christ came to be that covering for sin. And the word that we have here, propitiation, means the satisfactory payment. And it is very close to the word atonement, meaning that it met it was fully covering. How many of you have ever had a blanket on your bed that did not fully cover you? Uh, I have this problem quite a bit because blankets weren't made uh, for tall people. And uh, you get in bed and you think, oh, I need to pull the blanket up uh, to my neck. And you pull it up and your feet pop out the other end. And you say, uh-oh, this is a problem. And so uh, you scrunch it back down, get your feet covered, and it comes up to about here. Uh, it's even worse with sleeping bags. You know, you're trying to cuddle down in that thing uh, just to get inside the bag. And if it's, if it's not fully covering, if it's not uh, fully meeting the necessity, then how is it useful? If the atonement of Christ isn't fully covering. You say, well, it's fully covering if you know which audience 
should be covered. And that's where you lose me. Who did Christ die for? Who is it that he died for? And, and this is a question that I would have to admit until somebody introduced the idea to me. I had been reading the Bible for years and the question had never popped into my head. I had never looked at a verse and said, I wonder if Jesus died for everybody. He said, well, you grew up in a church where they didn't teach that, I admit. Uh, I did grow up in a church where they didn't teach that. And when it comes down to it, uh, I'm not sure where exactly you would want to get that from. Uh, for the reason of this, and that is the Bible says that the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, and if Jesus didn't die for everybody, it doesn't sound like good news to me. Matter of fact, it sounds like bad news for some, and only good news for those who qualify. Have you ever heard those car commercials? Zero percent financing. And you say, yeah, not for people like me. <laughs> uh, zero percent financing for the people who don't need credit. I mean, they've got so much money, uh, they're sure they're gonna loan them with no interest because you don't actually need uh, a loan. And it comes down to this matter of saying, well, uh, who then did Jesus uh, die for? Now in 1 John chapter two, in verse two, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Verse two says, and he is a propitiation for our sins, and then he goes on to make this statement, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so there is a, made a, a statement here to say it's not just our sins, and from the context here, he's saying we as believers, Jesus didn't just die for our sins as believers, he also died for the sins of the whole world. Almost intimating, saying, we don't believe in, in limited atonement. That it is a, a, an atonement that was made for the sins of the world. Limited, also called definite atonement. I think the word limited sounds pretty bad, and, and so I, if I believed it, I would probably call it definite atonement too. Uh, because it wouldn't sound like some people were not atoned for. Other places in the world, uh, including uh, England and some of uh, Europe, those there called it particular redemption. Particular redemption. That a particular group of people were redeemed. And from that came the particular Baptists. How many of you have ever heard of particular Baptists? Uh, they like everything just so-so. I mean, they're really particular. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's where the history uh, of the particular Baptists as opposed to those who believe that the atonement of Christ was for all people, and they called themselves the General Baptists. And so the General Baptists went on, uh, and many different Baptist groups came out of that. And so there was this divide of people, both calling themselves Baptists, one who's saying, no, no, Jesus did not die for everyone. He died for a particular group of people, uh, and the other saying, no, Jesus did die uh, for everyone, and the redemption was made in general and received in particular. Hmm. What is limited atonement? Well, those who are proponents of it would state it this way. If Christ died for the sins of the whole world and redeemed the sins of the whole world, then were all the world saved. If he died for them, then the whole world must be saved. So if he died for sins, then every sin that he died for was redeemed. Therefore, if God decided to punish that person, he could not because it would be double jeopardy. He would have said, well, Jesus died for the sins here, but now you're going to die for your sins, and the idea of them is that Jesus died for these sins, therefore every person's sins that he died for have been paid for and God could never hold them responsible for it. Well, when you think about it that way, it kind of makes some sense. People don't espouse Christian beliefs because they're wacko and crazy. So there's some sense, so to speak, if you go down that road, you think to yourself, well, yeah, I guess if, if, if Jesus did die for sins, and then, okay, so the sins were atoned, how could God then go back and punish those people? Therefore, Jesus must have 
only died for the sins of the elect. Again, we talked about election. That is those that God has said will be saved. And some have the view of election as well. God looks ahead. He sees who will be saved. And then he makes them the elect. And because he sees they're going to be saved, he makes them the elect. And therefore, Jesus only died for those that God knew would be saved. And then some that take it a little bit further and they just say that it was predestinated in God's plan. He chose before the foundation of the world who would be saved and who would not. Now, I, I say that because there are many, even in our day, major leaders in Christianity who have this belief and they have no problem, absolutely no problem saying God chose some for his own glory and pleasure and others he did not choose and they remain in their sins. That's what they say. They don't back away from it. They don't apologize for it. They don't try to hush-hush it. Uh, it's clear that's what's being said. And many who believe this may start out and say, well, uh, I'm kind of quasi, uh, kind of half and half. I'm kind of, yeah, well, uh, the elect is what God knew would be saved. But they eventually work their way in this system over to God chose particular ones. The only thing is we don't know who they are, so we're going to continue to spread the gospel. And so it doesn't limit them from spreading the gospel, but I can tell you from my experience, it takes the fervor out of giving the gospel message. Now we're no longer concerned for their souls because we know they're already destined one place or another and we're going to make no difference. And I have seen it time and time again. If we know that God has already destined them or we know that they have been elected, then there's no urgency to sharing the gospel. Now can I ask you, when Jesus commanded in the Great Commission to share the gospel, did you sense any urgency in his voice? Did you sense any urgency in his words? Did he say, go and inform the world of these things? Or did he say, go and preach the gospel? Did he say, well, you know, it just doesn't matter. Wherever you're at, just tell people about me. Or did he say, strategically, with great effort, go both here in the next area, farther out, and make it to the whole world? Why would he say that if people were already destined one way or the other? And so the many who have gone down this path of limited atonement come to this point of saying, well, they need to hear the gospel, but I'll tell you, and, and this grieves my heart, the appeals to hear the gospel are pretty much the saved preaching to the damned rather than a sinner saved by grace trying to reach another sinner so that they might be saved. And the tone changes. And the attitude changes. And this is where I begin to look at this and say, okay, uh, let's go back to the Bible and ask ourselves the question, is the Bible teaching that Christ only died for some? And I think it would be important then for us to go to key passages that they bring out and say, here is a key passage showing that Jesus died for some. Go, if you would, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, when Jesus shows his care for us in an analogy to a shepherd. How many of you read John chapter 10 and uh, called uh, the shepherds, uh, if I can remember what it was called, I'd tell you. Something about a shepherd. The shepherd's discourse, the pastoral discourse. I'll come up with it. I'll make up something that'll sound really good, uh, and then you'll repeat me and find out it's wrong. John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay my life down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. The idea here uh, is of sheep that are in mixed herds. Understand what I mean by mixed herds? There's several owners of the sheep. 
And shepherds, as they would be out on the hills and the sheep would be grazing together, the shepherd could speak, and it's still this way today. Shepherds will speak, and the sheep respond to the voice of that one shepherd. Matter of fact, it's one of the few animals that when uh, the, the herder speaks to them, they draw themselves immediately. And as they say it's even startling. Uh, I've seen it happen in a small fashion, uh, but they say it's really startling, especially if you have a couple hundred sheep and the shepherd will come out and will say something and all the sheep will immediately crowd to the fence right where the shepherd is, like in a stampede, and then they stop and they stare at the shepherd. Uh, and so they know the voice of the shepherd, okay? So he says here that that my sheep, they know my voice, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Let's go down a little bit further here. Uh, these verses being pointed out uh, for this reason. Jesus answered them, verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so, uh, is given the idea of here that people are either sheep, or, does anybody know the other one? Goats. And so we're born into this world, some as sheep, and they will hear the shepherd's voice, and some as goats, which will not hear the shepherd's voice. And so, the term is used, they're given spiritual ears. And you've read Matthew chapter 13, him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And they're told that an unregenerate man has been given spiritual ears, so when he is called by God, he is then, because of his election, he will respond to salvation, whereas others would not respond because they're not his sheep. Hmm. Interesting thought. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25 then. Matthew chapter 25. I do not deny that there are well-crafted arguments. And the reason that so many fall into these things because the arguments are well crafted. But to accept the premise, the premise that him saying, they're my sheep, I give them eternal life, I die for them, means that they were born as sheep and there didn't come a point, you say, well, you're either a sheep or a goat. Um, well, except for the Bible says you pass from death to life. That he says the old man dies and God makes a new creature that we are entirely changed at salvation. And so we've got to start to think and say, is the premise of it okay? Because if we just take the premise, then we may run down the wrong path. We've got to ask ourselves, now wait a second, based on the premise of it, is that what Jesus was trying to say? Matthew 25, again Jesus speaking, is he talking about the sheep being the elect or is he talking about the sheep being the redeemed? Let me say that's an important question. Are they the elect? Or are those who are redeemed the sheep? Well, let's ask ourselves. Obviously, this is the other key passage on sheep and goats. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Then he shall separate them, one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the question is here, are the sheep people that have been redeemed by God and now are sheep in his fold, or were they always sheep? And I guess that's what asks, brings me to this question. If they're always sheep, what need have they of redemption? If they already had the new nature, that already had spiritual ears, that would already hear God when he calls, then whatever happened to were dead in trespasses and sin? 
Whatever happened to the fact that uh, our nature uh, is dead uh, and we need a new, alive nature. And I'm sorry, for those of you who are following this over the several weeks, you can't have total depravity and say we're totally dead and unable to respond, then afterwards say, oh, but only the elect can hear because they have spiritual ears. You get to choose one. You get to pick one. You can get over here and say, well, they couldn't hear a thing, and that's why God had to elect them. And if they are already that way, what have need of they of redemption? In other words, how we view the Bible, how we read the Bible, and let me say, what assumptions we are willing to make about what's being said. By the way, if you go back to John chapter 10, you find out that Jesus Christ is talking to unbelieving Pharisees. And he said, the miracles that I've done, they've testified of me, but you will not believe. Hey, by the way, if they did believe, what would happen? They'd be saved. And then what would happen? They'd believe his miracles. And then what would happen? They'd hear his voice. And then what would happen? Well, they would follow him, and then what would happen? Uh, They would be of his fold. Uh, In other words, all things are fulfilled in that if they would believe. But this matter eliminates the necessity of believing. Matter of fact, faith in itself has said that God, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit for illustration, but God reaches inside of us and kind of has faith back at himself through us. That's kind of the description, very, very oversimplified. But that we have no ability to have faith, and so God comes upon us by his irresistible grace. It's placed in us, and then we have faith back that he put in our hearts, and we would have never believed. And so it comes down to this matter of saying, uh, what is the background of this? You know, the atonement of sins. Let's go back again, and and I want you to reference it because I know my brain jumps all over the place, but I don't want to assume yours is jumping in the same places that mine is. So let me go back and reference again 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2, he says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the what? The sins of the whole world. I, I've, I've heard this said one time. Well, you have to understand, not one drop of blood that Jesus shed on the cross was wasted. Can, can I say this? God didn't gather up and say, okay, one drop for your sins, one drop for your sins, one drop for your sins. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, the collective blood of Jesus Christ, was the necessary payment for sins. It wasn't parsed out. It's a little bit for everybody. You didn't get a little bit of the blood of Christ covering your sins. You have all of the blood of Christ covering your sins. You see, because we know the history of it. We have an Old Testament. Aren't you glad for the Old Testament that carries out in pictures what would happen when Jesus Christ came as a sacrifice. So we say, well, well, how did this happen? When was the propitiation made? Well, the propitiation was made when the blood of the lamb was spilled and they took the blood in and they made a sacrifice for how many of the people in the nation? Oh, all? For all of Israel? All of them, and so they would go in and and they wouldn't say, well, there's one drop for Judah and one drop. No. They put a, an atonement, which was a covering. And how many remember that they took the blood and they covered the mercy seat with it? And that was symbolic of the sins being covered that God saw that covering and would see the sins no more. Now, John 1 and verse 29 We hear John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the what? Sins of the who? Well, here it is again. It keeps popping up, this world. The sins of the world. He he is a propitiation, not for our sins only, but the sins of the whole world. And then John the Baptist says, Hey, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins uh, of the world. Well, then the history uh, of the sacrifice is, 
then lets us know about the atonement. Second Chronicles 29, Hezekiah, as he is directing the people, so the sons of Aaron, they come and they kill the sacrifices. In verse 24, Second Chronicles 29, 24, and the priests killed them and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For everybody. So we have to understand, you know, well, that was Israel and then there was the rest of the world. Okay. I get you on that, except for, here it says for all Israel, and later it says for the whole world. So in the Old Testament, the picture is my people Israel. In the New Testament, he says the whole world. He didn't say, well, this group of elect, that is like a picture of Israel in the world. It didn't say that. It says the whole world. He says the atonement is for a group that is the size of the whole world. So we see founded in the history of the sacrifice. So that brings me to this question. Who is the world? Who is the world? Who would you be saying if the Bible says that it's for the sins of the whole world, who is included in that? How many of you think that's a pretty simple answer? You're like, Pastor, you're asking us easy questions. Obviously, these are for the kids. That's why I'm not answering. We'll let the kids take a shot at this one. Uh, if he died for the sins of the whole world, who's included in that? Aliens not, because they don't live in the world, okay? But I would dare say the population of planet Earth, and obviously not in the time only when Jesus was on Earth, because he was commanding them, go tell the world, after he was going to be taken up into heaven. And so therefore, we understand that his salvation was extended to the end of the world as he gave his commission, that he would be with them to the end of the world. So, it begs the question, what does he mean by world? How many of you say, why do we have to ask that question? That's a, that's a simple one. But can I tell you, these are the questions that are being asked. For those who espouse this doctrine of limited atonement, they would ask you, well, what do you mean by the world? If you don't believe me, one of the leading Calvinists had a conversation about his book that he wrote about limited atonement. That was the topic. And they were asking him, and I have a clip for you. It's an audio clip. I want you to hear. This is where it starts to get confusing because something as simple as the world isn't the world anymore. And so we've got to ask all kinds of questions. So if you would, let's play that audio clip. This morning, I was reading in 1 John a very, a very um, common verse opposing definite atonement or limited atonement. And so uh, I thought I'd, I'd throw together these two, my thoughts from my devotions and my response to some of these um, reviews like this. Um, my main response is to encourage people, everybody who's listening to this, anybody who reads the book, reads their Bible, reads the review, whenever you uh, hear somebody make a comment about the death of Christ, be sure that you ask, what do you think that means? In other words, if somebody says, Jesus died for all people, fine, I'm not going to disagree with that until... I ask, what do you think that means? So when, when you're in an argument or a conversation with somebody about the extent or the effectiveness of the atonement, don't, don't um, smash each other with slogans. <laughs> it's useless just to keep saying, he did that for everybody, he didn't die for everybody, he did that for everybody, he didn't die. Well, that's just useless. You've got to stop and say, what do you mean when you say, he died for everybody. I, the controversy around this doctrine, it seems to me, perhaps more than any other, starts spinning its wheels on the ice, getting nowhere, because people are quoting verses to each other without asking, now what do you, what do you think that means? So for example, I was listening to my father preach last Sunday. He's been in heaven for six years. And I've got numerous recordings of his preaching. I love to listen to my dad 
preach. So he's preaching a sermon called The Secrets of Spiritual Power. My wife and I are listening uh, at a bed and breakfast where we were celebrating our 45th wedding anniversary. And he suddenly stopped and said, do you believe Jesus died for everyone? Aren't you glad Jesus died for everyone? <laughs> I just loved it. And, uh, and we looked at each other, Noel and I looked at each other. The next thing out of his mouth was this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should have so immediately I know exactly what my father's thinking. He's thinking Jesus died for everyone in the sense that everyone who believes will be saved. Which is exactly what I believe. <laughs> How many of you say that uh, is an amazing twisting of words there? <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you mean? When you say Jesus died for the whole world, what do, you, what do you mean by that? How many of you say, I thought the meaning was pretty clear, pretty straightforward. When the Bible says Jesus died for the world... There needs to be no qualifier. Matter of fact, this man, probably one of the two leading proponents in America of Calvinism, who's heard often uh, and around the world on this subject, there chuckles at his dad, who, by the way, was not a Calvinist, because when his dad said, aren't you glad Jesus died for the whole world, he chuckled. And I, I, I just want to say this. For those who believe this uh, stuff, they often, in arrogance, chuckle at your ignorance and mine. And I find that disturbing. I find it disturbing that he would chuckle at his dad's statement. I, I just say, I'm just saying when it comes down to when I say he died for the whole world, it's that simple. You see, when we start to take very simple passages and try to make them much more complex so that they fit more difficult passages, We've gone the wrong way. When we take a difficult passage and we say, you know, this is hard for me to understand, but I can go back and interpret it with the very clear statements from the Word of God. The very clear statements of the Word of God will help me know what this more difficult passage means. Then we are using the right approach to Scripture. Unfortunately, there are those in order to fit their view of the Word of God will change the simple statements of Scripture and say, well, I mean, you say he died for the whole world, but I mean, what do you mean by that? And I would respond to that exactly what it says. I need to add no further explanation because it's what Jesus said. And I'm very confident that if Jesus wanted us to know otherwise, he didn't misspeak he would have said, for God so loved the world of those who have been chosen and are elected to receive the predestined salvation that he gave his only begotten son. Anybody believe that Jesus misspoke? And to try to read into a passage about Jesus speaking as a shepherd and say, well, you have to understand sheep uh, and that means and therefore and read that in and just go right over and gloss over the clearest statements from the word of God. Can I tell you, friend, it's to do an injustice. And the Bible says that the faithful steward of God will rightly divide the word of truth. You say, who was on that video? Well, he's a leader. If you ever run into him, I hope it's not the person that you will be bothered by, but the teaching. Uh, we don't need more division in Christianity and hating this person or downing that person. I'm just saying, when you hear that teaching, you ought to go, you know what? I see that they believe in limited atonement, and I don't believe what that, because the Bible says clearly that Jesus died for all. He said, well, there's some more difficult passages that I would love to speak with you on. I as well would love to talk with you about them. But can we never go over the clear passages? And I want to show you John chapter 3 and actually show you how that built in to Jesus' statements in John chapter 3 is an Old Testament example of this. And in the Old Testament example is clearly not election that saved them, 
but rather them putting their faith in what God provided for their salvation. Let's take just a moment to look at that, and then we're going to go to Denny's. All right. John chapter 3, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to John 3, and we're going to take a running start at John 3.16. All right? John chapter 3. By the way, many times people will chuckle and even uh, mock a little bit your place and where you stand in your faith. Don't let that shake you. Don't let that shake you. If you're standing on the Word of God, let them laugh. Let them laugh. If you know what God's Word says. Now, if we're woefully ignorant of what God's Word says, we would have something of which to be ashamed. But if we've gone to God's Word and built our beliefs on the Word of God, and, and I'll tell you what, many of us in time will come to realize some of the things we thought about the Word of God weren't exactly accurate. You know, I, I've heard people say that, you know, uh, neither a lender nor a borrower be. That's what the Bible says. It, it actually doesn't say that. Um, and, you know, as long as you don't have 15 divorces, the Bible's okay with it. You know, it doesn't say that either. So uh, there's a lot of things that people attribute to the Bible. We need to know God's Word. But when we know it, uh, we don't have to be ashamed of it. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 14, whether or not you have paragraph marks in your Bible, it doesn't mean that Jesus stopped and changed subjects. How many of you have read John chapter 3 from beginning to end? It's one long discourse to Nicodemus. It is one long conversation in which he is telling Nicodemus what he needs to know about salvation. John chapter 3 verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What does it mean by lifted up? Exalt him? No, it means crucified. It means crucified. So Jesus Christ must be lifted up. Uh, and we know that from other passages. Verse 15, that whosoever does what? Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then he goes on, and verse 15 is expanded in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, what's the next word? Whosoever. Well, that's, that's interesting he'd use the word whosoever when only some could believe and receive. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't say, we'll be saved. He didn't say, well, I died for everybody, so everybody's going to be saved. Or I just died for some. He said that they might be saved. They have the opportunity, the possibility of being saved. Now, let's take verse 14, and let's go to the Old Testament passage in which Moses lifted up the serpent. You say, why is that important? Because in verse 14, he said, and as Moses lifted up. How many of you say that means we can go to the Old Testament and find out what Moses did, and that's the way it would be done? Okay, so we go to the Old Testament to Numbers chapter 21, verse 7. Numbers 21, verse 7. Numbers 21, verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. We understand uh, this is a point in which they spoke against the Lord. And the Lord sent fiery serpents into them. And those were poisonous serpents. And when they bit, they had the poison in their body. Obviously, it's a analogous to us having the poison of sin in us. And unless something from without becomes that answer, uh, we will die because of that poison. Okay? Then we see in verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. Boy, so many wonderful things here. Jesus Christ took on the form uh, of man and came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He wasn't sinful himself, but Romans chapter 8 says he took on the likeness of sinful flesh. So he says, okay, I want you to make the likeness. Don't put a snake on a pole. That thing will slither down and bite you, okay? He said, but make the likeness of the snake 
and put it on the pole and raise it up before the people. How many of you know that the sign for healing in our medical industry is still that? Uh, you have the pole with the, the serpent uh, around it. And so uh, in verse 8 he says, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten shall live. Is that what it says? Were you reading along in verse 8? Let's try it again. I might have missed a few words. I'm slightly myopic at times. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten shall live. Is that what it says? It would be very convenient for other doctrines if that's what it said. Therefore, the, the atonement was made and immediately the people would be healed. But instead it says that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Hmm. Well, you might just say, well, it's the story in the Old Testament and it doesn't really have anything to do with salvation except for Jesus called it out. And in John chapter 3, verse 14, he said, as it was then, so it is now. So, here we look at that picture and we say, Moses held it up, but it being held up didn't heal anybody. They had to put their faith in that thing which God said would bring them redemption and healing, and they had to look at it. That means that for some it was available, and they died with the poison because they wouldn't look at their own choice. You see, what we're trying to do by creating these arguments is to take the free will of man out of the equation altogether. Because somehow we think, well, if man has a free will to choose salvation, then he's responsible for his salvation. And God is not. I'm not sure where that ever came in. That'd be like going down to the car lot and having somebody willing to pay $25,000 so you can drive away with a brand new car and you say, I would like that one. And then you pat yourself on the back because you picked out the color. <laughs> they paid for it. Can I say Christ paid for it all? But in an attempt to take out man's free will to choose to reject Christ or to receive him, then begins to say, well, <clears throat> then we're going to have to construct it in such a way that God retains all of his sovereignty and man only has the appearance of free will. Are you with me? I like what A.W. Tozer said. He said, there is a God so sovereign that he can afford man free will and not lose his right of sovereignty. Think about that. He said anything less than that would not be a sovereign God. Anything less than that. Well, I, I can't let them choose because then I won't be sovereign. So I'm going to make them all mechanical robots and I retain my sovereignty that way. Can I tell you God is sovereign? God is awesome. Have you noticed that God is awesome? <laughs> Have you noticed that God could let Joseph get sold into slavery and still make him the king of Egypt? I mean, uh, haven't you noticed that God isn't hindered by Babylonian kings to make his man Daniel stand as a testimony in heathen nations? Haven't you noticed that God is not hindered uh, by the wicked plans of man trying to imprison uh, the apostles, yet uh, their testimony abounded more and more and more and more. God used it. You see, the, the will of man, it's not a problem for God. He's that sovereign. He's that powerful. He's that able. And so he said, I'll pay the price for the sins of the whole world. But those that believe will have that applied to their account. The book of Romans says it's imputed. You know what happens beforehand? It's paid, but that thing hadn't been imputed. It's true. There's some conflicting doctrines. See, when you wade off over into this one and go, well, if Jesus died for everybody, then everybody would have to be saved. No, not until God imputes it. <laughs> 
And the Bible says it was imputed when Abraham believed God. And then it was counted to him because it wasn't Abraham's righteousness. It was the righteousness of Christ. So it wasn't applied to him until he believed. And then God said, okay, mark it on his account. How much blood do we give him? All of it. All of the blood covers all of his sins. We're not doling out blood samples to everybody. The blood of Christ covers sins. And listen, when we trust him for salvation, then it covers our sins. And the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us when we trust him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. Thank you so much for dying on the cross for all of our sins. And Lord, I'm thankful that there are still people out in this world that don't know you, who've never heard of you, and yet you've died for their sins. And it's just waiting for a time when a Christian will come and take the glorious light of the gospel so that they may hear it.